because it wasn't just Germany that depleted their gold reserves. I mean, all, France, yeah. the UK, like they all went off the gold standard. They all spent their treasure. Um, and, you know, who was selling them arms? Uh -huh. The United States. Yeah. Um, and we demanded payment in gold. Uh -huh. um, we also demanded payment of war debts in gold. Uh -huh. So we basically sucked up three-fourths of the world's gold reserves in the first half of the 20th century because we were the creditors to all these countries. And that's and so, the story of the U.S. Yeah. rise to superpower, basically. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So again, you follow the gold and right. you follow the geopolitical power. <laughs> exactly. Very fascinating. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Natalie Smolensky, welcome Hi. to the What Is Money Show. Thank you for having me. So great to have you. I'm very excited for this uh, cerebral content we're going to be covering <laughs> today. Um, and before we get started, just by way of quick introduction, you are a Bitcoin entrepreneur. You are the founder of the Texas Bitcoin Foundation, and you're also an anthropologist and an author of the paper we're going to be discussing today, which is titled Toward an Anthropological Theory of Money. So before we dive in to this very interesting paper, can you just tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, what inspired you to write this? And maybe just a little overview of what we're going to be discussing today. Yes, absolutely. So before I became a software entrepreneur, I was an anthropologist. I was very interested in questions of value. Um, and I approached that in the early days through the anthropology of religion. So I was really interested in the notion of sanctity, uh -huh. of the holy, um, as something that is priceless, that, uh -huh. that can't be quantified um, in price, versus everything in the exchange economy that, that can be. Uh -huh. um, and so Bitcoin has proven to be this wonderful social experiment in what value is and how nice. it's created in real time. Mm. It's fascinating. Um, and then the the religious piece, I think later on Zaba will talk about this, but religion played some role in minimizing trust among people, right? So that we could mm -hmm. increase mm -hmm. social cooperation. And right. I think there are some parallels there with money in a way, mm -hmm. right? That it allows us to enhance social cooperation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about social institutions here in a moment, but uh, that is the purpose of a social institution is to facilitate cooperation between people. Interesting. So 
this started, this paper, I think. Yeah. You said you were keying off on a Twitter debate between David Graeber and Nick Sabo. Yes. Uh, David Graeber is, I think he's written several books, but the one of one that is most famous of his is Debt, The First 5,000 Years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick Szabo is a prolific writer as well. Uh, the Unenumerated Blog, I think, is, is his. He's yeah. written a lot on the history and evolution of money as well. And they got into a little spat on Twitter in 2018. Yeah. Um, what was, and I guess, as you say in this paper, you're trying to develop a dialogue between yes. these two opposing viewpoints. Yeah. So what was that debate about? And what is this paper uh, going toward to try and bring the dialogue between the two points? Yeah. Um, so in the first decade or so of Bitcoin's existence, one of the big debates within um, not just the Bitcoin community, but the broader crypto community was, what is money? Is it a store of value? Is it a medium of exchange? Is it a unit of account? And people really develop these entrenched kind of tribal points of view about this. Mm. So this this debate was kicked off initially when uh, a journalist, Michael Casey, tweeted um, that uh, he quote tweeted Vitalik, uh, Buterin um, saying, you know, all you crypto gold bugs need to listen to Vitalik because money was um, a medium of exchange long before it was a store of value. And Nick Sabo responded to that being like, well, if you actually look at the historical and ethnographic evidence, there's ample documentation of money being used as a store of value long before, you know, we had anything like, uh, let's say, a currency. Someone asked him, um, so what do you think of Graeber's theory of money as debt? Um, And Sabo's response was that Graeber was operating from a very narrow definition of money, Uh um, which caught Graeber's attention. And uh, he was like, really? Um, So blah, blah, blah. And they kind of went back and forth and a number of people jumped in. um, And at the end of the day, like, I was, you know, following this debate in real time. Um, at the end of the day, the disagreement seemed to be about whether or not money was a store of value. Uh, and Graeber seemed very hostile uh, to the point of view that that it was a store of value. Um, so I decided to read his work closely um, to understand how he's approaching value. Uh, um, so he has two major works on value. One is um, his 2001 book, Towards an Anthropological Theory of Value, um, which actually Elaine O oh, cites in the Twitter debate. She's like, do you, do you disagree with yourself? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you point out that it's been a store of value. Um, but he doesn't systematically elib- elaborate a theory of money until debt. And so that's the book that I really focus on in this paper. Um, and I, I take his argument to root um, because... At one point, um, he makes the claim that money is, in effect, nothing other than a unit of account. Mm. Um, And so that was probably the origin of Sabo's contention, that he's operating from a narrow definition of money. Um, That that would be, in fact, a narrow definition of money. Um, But it's not just that, for Graeber, money is a, uh, a unit of account. He also fully subscribes to the credit state theory of money. Um, So even though he, you know, uh, makes it very clear throughout the book that uh, economists are dead wrong about everything and why does anybody take economics seriously as as a discipline, a lot of political polemic, um, at the end of the day, he draws on three major economists to make his argument about what money is. Uh. He draws on um, Alfred Mitchell Innes, who elaborated the credit theory of money, um, on George Friedrich Knopp, who uh, wrote the state theory of money, and then on John Maynard Keynes, Uh. who uh, actually was responsible for having Knopp's book translated into English, um, and then cites it at the beginning of his treatise on money to argue that all money uh, is state money at, at this point. Um, and so Graeber, you know, he he kind of, there's a little bit of sleight of hand there in, in that you have to read his whole work 
to kind of figure out that this is this is his theory of money. Um, but uh, I I got to that. And uh, he, he at one point has this quote where he says, a coin is effectively an IOU. Conceptually, the idea that a piece of gold is really just an IOU is always rather difficult to wrap one's head around. But something like this must be true because even when gold and silver coins were in use, they almost never circulated at their bullion value. So that is, in fact, a very confusing claim to make, uh-huh. both parts of that sentence. Um, because, uh, well, first of all, um, you know, gold is actually where it's used as money. Um, it it is a self settling mechanism, mm. so it's not an IOU. It's yeah. it's you're actually settling the debt in real time um, when you're paying in terms of commodity money. Um, but also, he doesn't seem to be aware of like what a monetary premium is, uh-huh. and so he's you know he's surprised that gold in a coin may circulate at a different value than like gold as a commodity. And in fact, markets do price different use cases of the same commodity differently. Uh Um, And so again, this proved to me that there's this need for a dialogue between anthropologists and economists because they, they need to benefit from one another's insights about value. Yes. Yeah. So on the bridging together economists and anthropologists and I think offline you you said someone said that I think it was an anthropologist that said economics might even be the anti-anthropology something to that effect yes so um, Marshall Sollins who is arguably the most uh, influential anthropologist of the 20th century past century he, he passed away recently um, he wrote uh, a few years ago in in a paper uh, economics is the anti-anthropology. Huh. And Solins was actually Graeber's mentor, uh, um, dissertation advisor, and longtime intellectual collaborator. So they co-authored books together uh-huh. like they were they were both in deep dialogue. Um, and they both share the point of view that, you know, economists are basically just apologists for capitalism, which they both consider evil. Uh, um, <laughs> and so like, the discipline is pure ideology that, you know, there's no reason to study economics because its assumptions about humankind are so deeply flawed that it doesn't actually produce knowledge for us. Um, That obviously is not the case from, from my point of view. Um, There are ideological economists, just like there are ideological anthropologists. Mm -hmm. They just take different, they have different methodological approaches to the study of value and I think both need to be synthesized. Yeah, and are they picking on Keynesian economists in particular? Are they picking on Austrian economists? Because it, it doesn't sound like they specified. So no. on, on the issue of value itself, yeah, I think an Austrian economist would say all action is an expression of value. Right. Right, whereas I'm not so sure what a Keynesian definition of value would be. Although... It is broadly accepted that value is subjective among mm-hmm. all economists today. So who were they referring to in that in that instance? You know? That's a fabulous question. Um, mostly it's what they call neoclassical economics. Okay. So, um, you know, kind of one among many schools, as you point out, of economic thought. Um, neoclassical economics is often uh, caricatured as kind of this uh, almost like practice of toy model building uh-huh. where, you know, everything can be formally modeled. Um, and, you know, so it's easy to pick on because these models generally aren't predictive of anything. Uh-huh. Um, and in fact, many Keynesian economists or um, economists in other schools draw on the neoclassical tradition. Um, what's funny, though, is that I think Graeber and Solins would actually have a lot in common with the Austrian school. Uh, but they don't read Austrians because they they see Austrians as their, like, in many ways, biggest ideological opponents huh. because they're committed to free markets. They're committed to a liberty-oriented description of human action, uh-huh. whereas anthropologists tend to not be. And so it's 
it's really crazy because like Graeber will, he'll come straight out and say, there is no such thing as a free market. All markets are created by the state. They're all created by governments in the process of issuing money to wage war. And so he's an anarchist, but he calls for the abolition of the state in order to abolish the market. Um, so it's like, like Graeber's actual theory of value is an action theory of value. Like, like this wow. is in his 2001 book, um, it's an action oriented theory of value, yeah. but they hate markets um, and what they consider to be the ideology of markets so much that they won't even read Mises or um, Hayek or Menger, for right. example. Like they caricature their positions, whereas they'll they'll deign to read Keynesians or um, neoclassical economists like Samuelson, yeah. for example. That's so interesting. So just because of the, it counters their ideology, they just refuse to right. read their work and then they end up talking past. Each other. Or Zabo and Graeber. Right. At least to some extent, Graeber talking past Zabo's points because he doesn't understand his points, exactly. which Zabo admits later in the Twitter debate he doesn't understand his so much either. Yeah. Yeah. What well, you would think people would have the humility to just say, look, maybe I don't know. Right. I haven't read this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um yeah. but clearly there's a lot of ego at play in these debates. So yeah. if we look at Graeber's book and his theory of money, let's That's say it. in the in his book Debt, the first five thousand years. I believe offline you said he views money as a creature of law uh -huh. and law is social consensus. Right. So is he asserting that social consensus itself is only established by the state and that the state then establishes money to establish markets? So it's a top-down theory of money? Yeah. Um, so... You know, from Graeber's point of view, m money, true money, is issued by a state. Um, and so we don't actually see money enter into human history until we see coinage. Uh -huh. um, and, and that is one theory of money. Like other anthropologists like Keith Hart, for example, uh -huh. have basically said money is coinage. Uh -huh. um, now, the problem with that is, you know, then there's this slippage between um, the law defining what is legal tender, you know, what counts as yeah. settlement of debts or obligations within a jurisdiction, and the coin itself, which um, often has bullion uh, in it or some commodity that is intrinsically valuable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Keith Hart tried to square the circle and said, you know, money needs both. It has to be issued by a state, but it also has to be valued by the market, uh, but, which isn't really a, a coherent theory. It's it's kind of trying to be two things at once without having an account of either. Um, Graeber um, comes straight out and says, commodities have no intrinsic value. Gold has no intrinsic value, uh -huh. um, which is prima facie just incorrect. Uh -huh. I mean, that's just not true. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, these things, like, well, what does intrinsic value mean? Well, use value. Uh -huh. um, gold is beautiful. Um, it doesn't tarnish. Um, it's uh, used for adornment. It's also used in various technologies. Um, so it, it does absolutely have concrete use value. And this, isn't that yeah. proven when it has a, anything that has a price in the market has... Right. Use value by definition almost. Right. It's people are bidding to obtain the thing, therefore it has a price. Mm -hmm. If they're bidding to obtain the thing, then doesn't that in imply or prove even that it has use value? Right. Um, exactly. I, I would agree. I mean, if like if you just put fiat banknotes on the market, they you know, someone might be willing to pay something for them for like novelty or yeah. aesthetic value or something but but minimal. Uh -huh. um, it, it's almost completely devoid of use value. Uh -huh. um, and so when we talk about uh, fiat money, um, we're actually talking about um, all of the value uh -huh. being um, residing in the credit worthiness of the issuing authority, which is the state. Right. So back to Graeber then, if he's saying that money is a creature of the law, Law is social consensus. How does he deal with 
interstate payments. So if you know yeah. two countries go to war, one loses, the winner requires that the loser pay them reparations, so let's say in gold. Uh-huh. How does he deal with that? Is that not money in that case? Right. Yeah. So uh, again, there's a kind of contradiction in in some of Graeber's work because he he comes straight out and says commodity money is used under conditions of low trust, uh-huh. um, specifically in times of war. Um, so why did axial age states start minting coins? Well, primarily to pay the first armies, um, the first standing armies in their quests for imperial expansion. These, you know, soldiers are not risking their lives out of the goodness of their hearts, and they're certainly not extending, you know, infinite credit to the state to say like, hey, we trust you, you're going to take care of us. No, um, like I would like the coins, please. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so he acknowledges, you know, commodity money are, uh, is used uh, in these circumstances. But the, he'll then go on to say even that commodity is debt, is mm-hmm. a form of debt, uh-huh. um, which this is where we disagree. Like I, I think this historical and ethnographic evidence um, does not support the claim that uh, commodity money is debt. Right. Yeah, it seems like a very glaring contradiction. Yeah. When he says gold is debt. And it's yeah. Like, I don't understand how that can be true. Right. And this is where, actually going back to your earlier point, um, you were asking about, so is all social consensus a creature of the state? There is a big difference This is the extent to which fiat has shaped social science. Uh, I'm just going to make this uh, claim right now. The anthropologists writing in the late 19th and early 20th century had a very different point of view on the state than anthropologists writing uh, today, late 20th century, uh early 21st century. And you can see this even within anthropologists of the same political orientation. Like, you know, Graeber would probably identify as a so- socialist um you know certainly he uh he calls for the abolition of markets and capitalism um it, he invokes marx um in the marxist tradition um but socialist anthropologists of the early 20th century they were often anti-state uh-huh. um because they saw the state as a, a point of violent uh, oppression and suppression of dissent, uh, particularly their points of view. Um, you know, Graeber's also anti-state, um, but he, he, I think, is reflecting his era in that he can't imagine political, social consensus taking any form other than the law. Um, which is a state implemented by the state, enforced by the state. Um, And so you see even in the most, you know, quote unquote, radical uh, social science uh, scientists um, in recent years, there's this inability to think past fiat. There's this inability to to imagine forms of social organization occurring outside of the state that could be a net positive for humanity. Right. And part of this has to also do with the way that um, bottom-up, non-state, grassroots movements have become ideologically coded. In the early and mid-20th century, they were often coded left. Today, they tend to be coded right. Uh Um, And so there's a kind of ideological mistrust of the communities that are creating these bottom-up phenomena and this hope that we can have a righteous state that will somehow adjudicate or mediate fairly between us. It's very interesting. That one always strikes me as odd when the justification for statism is, well, people are bad and they can't be trusted. Mm-hmm. So let's form a body of people that are bad and can't be trusted to govern and or dominate everyone right. else. So right. It's silly. And then I also think that, um, and maybe this is where Zabo is just more broad thinking than mm-hmm. Graeber. 
Because to say that only the state could establish social consensus flies in the face of the reality of the internet. Right. Right. Like we have all these internet protocols that are points of social consensus. Right. HTTP, TCP IP, et cetera. You could also look at things like the calendar, you know, I mean, obviously the state sort of messes with the calendar a little bit. We have daylight savings times and and other weird things in the U S but the calendar existed, uh, I mean, in different forms before the state. So that's a point of social consensus, people using to coordinate themselves. So it seems rather silly or intentionally myopic to try and say that only the state could form social consensus. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts about that? De- definitely. Um, I mean, when we talk about rules without rulers, what we're talking about is our ability to, um, in a, in a, emergent bottom-up way align on norms and potentially even laws yeah. without a single top-down authority. Right. This is common law, right? English common right. law. Right. Yeah. And Islamic law, yeah. for example. That That's a, a fascinating historical example of um, a religious structure existing as a trust mechanism, uh, um, particularly to facilitate trade. So, you know, the majority of Islamic expansion historically happened through the merchant class, um, particularly into like Southeast Asia. Um, it's it's a really interesting history. And you know, if you if you're a Muslim merchant um, doing business across continents, you can't necessarily trust that the king or prince in any of these principalities is going to share any of your moral uh, norms um, or have any sense for your interpretation of how contracts should be enforced. Mm -hmm. And so, in effect, the Islamic legal tradition, it's like multiple legal schools, but you could trust that wherever there's an Islamic court, your contracts are going to be enforced because they're they're using the same decentralized legal framework. Right. Um, And so these social technologies, social institutions, become ways that value is created and maintained over time without needing a state. That's great. So that segues nicely, I think, into the body of the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, again, title of the paper is Toward an Anthropological Theory of Money. Mm-hmm. And you assert, I believe, that money is a social institution and a social technology. Yeah. So can we define those two terms? And if there, what are the differences between a social institution and a social technology? Yeah, there, there is some overlap between what those terms mean. Um, I'm defining institutions following Douglas North, mm-hmm. who is an economist um, in what is known as the new institutionalism. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of the school of economic thought pioneered by uh, Ronald Coase, mm-hmm. um, who was himself a brilliant economist. Um, so North defines institutions as the humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interaction. They consist of both informal constraints, sanctions, taboos, customs, traditions, and codes of conduct, and formal rules, constitutions, laws, and property rights. Uh. So these are all institutions by which we basically just mean constraints. Uh They're constraints on action, but they're also constraints on imagination. You know, um, they they define horizons of possibility uh-huh. um, and they're enduring. They endure over time. It's hard to change institutions, uh-huh. um, which is why, you know, disruptive innovation is often resisted. It's fought because people's commitments to the existing forms of institutions tend to be very strong. Uh-huh. And there's a reason for that. Institutions arise to solve specific problems. So, you know, the family is an institution, Uh Um, marriage is an institution, Um, uh, law is an institution, Um, the contract is an institution, money is also an institution. So then the question becomes, what problem is money solving? Well, it is solving the problem of the double coincidence of wants, um, which is I want to trade with you and I have a bunch of apples and you have a bunch of oranges. you don't want any apples. So how, how are we going to trade? Um, well, money becomes uh, a way 
to put an intermediate good between those two final goods um, so that we can intermediate exchange. So it facilitates exchange. That's the problem it solves. Yeah. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. And then where do we distinguish a social technology from social institution? Because this one... I find a bit confounding. Mm-hmm. Money is a strange one, right? It's a little yeah. bit of both. But again, um, I like the example of the calendar. I often refer to it as a social technology. Um, again, not necessarily, I don't know. I mean, it solves a problem, which technology solves a problem, but it's not necessarily an institution in that it's it existed before the state, right? It existed before someone was able to uh, an institution needs to be institutionalized, like it needs to be enshrined within the law, doesn't it? Whereas a technology maybe does not. Is that the difference? Um, so institutions don't have to be legal. Okay. So like the family is an institution, okay. right. for example. Yeah. Um, it solves the problem of reproduction uh-huh. uh, of the species. And it's also the most primary unit of economic production. Uh-huh. So this this is where... You know, again, anthropologists really need to read the Austrian school because, yeah. like Marshall Solins, for example, wrote a magisterial work in the 1970s called Stone Age Economics, uh-huh. where he describes in minute detail the functioning of the domestic mode of production. Uh-huh. This is an era, the vast majority of human history, where the main unit of economic production was the family. Uh-huh. Um, it's not it's not necessarily that every household was self sufficient, but most households produced most of what they needed internally within the economy of the household. Um, Now, that's also not very efficient um, because then you're fully confined to whatever is locally available, whatever's in season, you're you're fully at the mercy of, you know, the weather. Um, Like any adverse, you don't have a lot of buffer in the case of catastrophes like war or famine or natural disasters. And so... What money does is um, n- not only does it help us solve the problem of the double coincidence of wants, but by solving that problem, it enables us to expand our sphere of economic production uh, because now I can trade more easily with people outside my household, outside my village, uh, outside even my my state, uh-huh. my or country. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, the proliferation of money, the adoption of money, let's say, as a social technology, also creates the groundwork for an explosion of economic production yeah. um, over time. 
And so that's what's interesting about social technologies. And Nick Sabo actually talks about this in, in some of his articles, where he talks about um, how we can imagine the history of technology um, as a history of differentiation. Early technologies tended to condense multiple functions into the same technology, uh -huh. the same tool, um, or the same institution. It was responsible for all this stuff. But as technology becomes more advanced, it also becomes more differentiated. So, you know, today, like, we wouldn't expect to generate, you know, everything we need to survive within our own household. There are some people who may choose to do that, but that's a lifestyle choice. Yeah. Um, we've figured out that it's far more efficient to get our toothpaste, you know, from Target yeah. and, you know, get our clothes from wherever yeah. um, and to focus our discretionary time and energy on producing economic value in very specific directions that we are specialized right, in. Right, right, right. So technology differentiates over time and also becomes more powerful over time. Uh -huh. But this in turn creates a crisis of institutions. Ah, uh. Because these institutions that initially did, you know, A, B, C, D, you uh -huh. know, through Z, now really only do A through D. Right. And this is part of why we have a crisis of the family. People are asking the question like, okay, well, if I don't need the family for economic reasons, like if I'm not dependent on my family no. economically, then what do I need it for? Uh -huh. And what, what do I prioritize? in life. Um, and so the history of the evolution of technology is also a history of moral crisis uh, in human societies that are crises of institutions. Right. Okay. Okay. Starting to get a, a feel for this now. So yeah, as the technological landscape changes, the use case for old institutions might go away, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get a new technology that right. solves a particular problem, the institution you had before it might uh, not be needed. And so the right. rough example I'm thinking of here, um, I think the reason we have central banking as an institution is because gold is not portable as money, basically. Right. Like it, there's an economic efficiency to be gained, putting all the gold in one place, right. issuing banknotes on top of it, using those as the medium of exchange because paper or electronic representations of paper are much more portable than physical gold. Yeah. So we're like, we're using the institution of centralized money warehousing or central banking as an institution to overcome the technological limitation of gold. Right. Now, if you look at that in a Bitcoin world, well, you don't really need the institution of central banking because now the digital gold is highly portable, right? right. You don't, there's not as much of an economic advantage to be gained if any, by centralizing its custody because it's right. trivial to exactly. custody it in, in many different ways. So is that kind of the the cyclical relationship you're talking about? It's like yes. new technologies kind of call into question the relevance of old institutions. Then you have new institutions that give rise to, give rise to new technologies and the cycle repeats. Yep, absolutely. Okay, yeah. that's very interesting okay so there is a difference okay because mm -hmm. i've often used both terms and i think i've used them interchangeably yeah okay the the next place you go on the paper is money as the most saleable good yeah and i think here you're drawing on the work of carl minger mm -hmm. uh which i assume graber has not read <laughs> yeah he refers to carl Menger, but he says that Manger said things he never said. So I don't I don't know if he's actually read Manger. <laughs> gotcha. So what are you in, in that portion of the paper, what uh what is the point you're trying to drive there to to bridge the anthropologists and economists together? Yeah. So the uh, if money is a social technology that solves the problem of the double coincidence of wants, how does it do that? Uh -huh. And Acting as the most saleable good is how. Uh, so it's just the mechanism. Uh, um, it's it's the nature of the technology. It's really not a very profound point. Uh, it's yeah. just saying, you know, following Menger, it's the the thing that most people in the market are most likely to want. Uh, um, so if you carry a lot of it, you're going to accelerate your ability to transact. Um, 
and and you know then uh, Mises you know reiterates this and, and many economists follow Menger uh-huh. in, in this regard um, and like your point about calendars you know Menger says the state actually can um, add value here by doing things like standardizing the units of currency okay. so you know ensuring that they are of standard weights and measures uh-huh. Um, ensuring that they're not counterfeited. But he's like, the important thing is that the state is not the origin uh-huh, of uh-huh. money as the social technology. It's just coming in and refining the technology right. that's already there. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, too, based on my study, there were private coinage issuers before the state got into the business, as with most businesses, right? Mm-hmm. They usually start out as private businesses that the state then notices, hey, there's a, a revenue or control opportunity here. Let's get involved. Um, but it's somewhat intuitive that if you could standardize the money, that you could accelerate the pace of trade, mm-hmm. and therefore you're going to increase productivity Yep. Um, versus people, you know, weighing the gold and assaying right. the gold at every transaction. You're just sort of trusting the stamp of the issuer, whether that be a state or a, a private coinage business. Mm-hmm. Um, the next section of your paper is titled Spheres of Exchange. What are you talking about there? Yeah, so um, this is, I think, some of the most interesting anthropological work on money has been the development of this theory of spheres of exchange, yeah. which was um, it was pioneered by um, Paul and Laura Bohannon, um, who who studied uh, a community called the Tiv in Nigeria. Um, and uh, what they observed, they were they were doing their field work there like the mid 20th century. Um, so this was an economy that was in the process of transitioning from using various special purpose monies to one general purpose money, um, uh, colonial money. Um, and this created a moral crisis in their society because um, before they had separate spheres of exchange that used different forms of money. So if you wanted to, um, you know, let's say just transact daily in the market, you know, get food for dinner or um, like, ordinary necessities, tools that you're using every day, you used everyday money, a different type of money, um, or credit, a mental ledger, Uh right? But if you wanted more uh, prestigious things, you know, like land or uh, a home Mm -hmm. um, or a wife, let's say, you had to use different forms of money, special purpose money. Um, And these tended to be commodity monies. Uh Um, that were rare, they were scarce, and valuable. Um, When when Nigeria was colonized and um, general purpose money was introduced, suddenly you could use the same type of money for both types of transactions. And so people were like, this is, there's something immoral about this. I shouldn't be able to buy... um, you know, let's say a political office with the same money that I used to buy a chicken, you know, to slaughter for for dinner. But now I can do both. And most troubling was um, that now I can use general purpose money to pay a bride price. Um, And this was was an economy in which uh, marriage was its own separate sphere of exchange. And the way it worked culturally was that um, the elder males of a family unit um, decided what, who, like which of their girls would go marry which young men in the community. And they would decide this through a trade with, an, with elders from a different family unit. So it was the elder men who would trade women uh-huh. um, with e- with each other with between the families to establish a kind of social reciprocity hmm. um and so in the moral economy of the tiv the only thing that you can really trade for a bride is another bride hmm. um now th- this was a system of morality which also put all of the social authority 
in in these older men. Mm-hmm. Um, so it gave them a lot of power, not just over the the women, but the young men, mm-hmm. because it didn't matter how successful you were as a young man, how much you had achieved, how how wealthy you were. You couldn't choose your wife. You still had to have you know <laughs> convince an older man to swap with someone in your kin group. Um, and so with the introduction of general purpose money, um, it collapsed these moral spheres, mm. but it also undermined the authority of these family elders. And so the people who were most upset about it were actually these older men who no longer had the power to dictate who was going to marry who in their community. And so this is what George Simmel talks about where, when he talks about money as a socially liberating force. Right. Because, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, a woman, let's say, fleeing an abusive marriage, um, but I have money, I can use that money to get to safety right. and bootstrap, you know, a life. Whereas if, if I am captive to the moral economy where I have to just be subordinate, to these family authorities and I have n- nothing that I can change of value uh-huh. except perhaps my own body. Uh-huh. I mean, that that creates the conditions of slavery wow. for people. Yeah. And so it's always this double-edged sword. You know, the, the, the emancipation of some people is seen as just utter immorality by others. Uh, <laughs> is it that what was coming up for me there, back to the social institution discussion, yeah. It's like the social institution component of money was disrupting the established social institution of this inter-tribe bride swapping. Yes, yes. Is so is and that what whatever you call it the where the they called this the paterfamilias I think back in ancient Roman times. I don't know if you call this like a, a patriarchy or something yeah. where the head guy is in charge. And, right. So. Th- the patriarchy was the social institution, basically, and then general purpose money was a social institution that collapsed it. Yeah. And then obviously the, the patriarchs were pissed off. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so there are always many social institutions in any society. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you, ha- it, you have these new types of social institutions that come in and disrupt older ones. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. So it's yeah. not just money disrupting other monies. Right. So this is why money is a social institution. Right. Because it can disrupt things that are non-money social institutions. That's right. Fascinating. Um, okay, the the next section of your paper, you go into the three functions of money, mm-hmm. which are popularly understood to be store value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. And as you said earlier, Graeber tends to zero in on the unit of account as the only actual function of money. Right. I know someone like Mises would say the only actual function of money is basically medium of exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, and then everything else is like, you'd say store values like medium of exchange across time, medium of exchange is across space, and either of accounts like medium of exchange across minds, right? right. People are speaking the same language. Um, what, in this section, what are you going into, in, in relation to the functions of money, how are you connecting that to the rest of uh, the argument? Yeah, so um, I would take a a broad definition of money that it has to fulfill all of these functions. Mm -hmm. It has to act as a store of value, it has to act as a medium of exchange, and as a unit of account. Um, I don't think it actually can act as any one of these Uh without also being the other. Uh Um, In order to become the most saleable good, uh, a money has to be seen as valuable. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and economic actors have to be confident that that money is going to retain its value long enough into the future that it's worth it for them to Uh hold on to it Uh um, and use it again in the future. Um, So a a money that is not seen as a store of value, um, you know, very quickly no longer becomes money. You can't move value if you can't store value. Right, Right. exactly. And, And this is why, you know, some of Keynes's comments are so revealing. Like, you know, he he has uh, a comment. Uh, I can't remember in what context this was at the moment, but he's like, I don't understand why anybody uses money as a store of value. <laughs> like, why would you do that? 
that's not what money's for. Uh Like you want to store value, buy land, Uh you know, buy, buy some hard assets. Like don't use money. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that was his philosophy of money. Yeah. Um, But I, I, you know, I think that's a disastrous philosophy. Yeah. I hear the Austrians screaming in my ear. It's like, it's uncertainty, dummy. Right. Like if you don't know what's going to happen in the future, the more uncertain things are, the more options you want. Right. And money is basically pure optionality. So that's yep. why you would save in money. Exactly. Um, so it has to store value. Um, it it has to also help m- measure value. Uh-huh. Now, what do we mean by measuring value? There's a, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh-huh. Nick Sabo, I think, writes about this very, very cogently. Um, he writes that the measurement of value is one of the most intractable problems of civilization. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know... These, uh, the ways that we've solved this problem um, are, you know, have given rise to the discipline of accounting, um, you know, even even things like taxation, uh-huh. corporate finance. They, they wouldn't be possible without having some unit in which to demarcate the measurement of value. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, so uh, if we imagine an economy that's entirely credit based with with no unit of exchange, with no form of money, mm-hmm. you know, and I do a favor mm-hmm. for you. Um, how how are you going to pay me back? Right. Like, what does that even mean? Right. Like, how do you quantify the how value we, yeah. of the favor? Yeah. Um, and so, because value is so hard to measure, this gives rise to misunderstandings, grudges. Yeah. You know, in extreme situations like vendettas or blood feuds, yeah. because you know. People are trying to get their value, um, and if if there isn't a unit of account, that value is very hard to measure. Uh, so money has to store value; it has to be a measure of value, and then once it does those two things, uh, it's it's a medium of exchange. Right, like it pretty course. much automatically also is that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if Zabo uses it, that language or not, but one small semantic point that. A lot of Austrians, because I've I've tweeted about this before, right? Like money is a tool for measuring value, and they're like, "Oh no, value is subjective; it mm-hmm. cannot be measured." Yes. What you're actually doing is appraising value. Right. So there's a, a semantic thing there that exactly which I actually agree with. Yeah. You can't technically measure it. Yeah. But we do need some way to appraise it. You can even say, that's what the price is. Yes. Really, right. It's an appraisal of the value of a thing. That's a really important point. Thank you. Thank you for um, pointing that out. This is, yeah, uh, this is Mises' point. Yeah. Um, he makes this at length. You know, <laughs> any attempt to create like an objective measurement of value is yes. a fool's errand. Right. And, and he uses the example of the economist who came up with the the concept of the util. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly how many yes. utils for yes, that. Like yes, he's like, yes. that's not what money is. Yeah. And he's absolutely right. Price is not an objective metric of utility. Uh-huh. Um, it's just telling us, as Misa says, at what point um, the value of the money you're parting with as the buyer mm-hmm. is less than the value of the thing you're acquiring for that money. Right. The point at which that flip happens is the point at which you make purchase. Yes. And the collective information from all people making that decision is what determines price. The price, exactly. Which yeah. is the last... The last trade between a consensual buyer and seller, it flipped at that point. Yep. So it's like, it's a historical look back, Yeah. but it's changing all the time. So it's very relevant for future planning and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, I think this is a very important point. We go, you go into credit versus commodity money, which yep. is the crux perhaps of the disagreement maybe not the crux, but a crux of the disagreement between yeah. Graeber and Zabo. Um, what is credit money? What is commodity money? And how are they different? Yeah. So um, credit money versus commodity money, the only difference is the standard underpinning the value of that currency. Um, In the case of credit money, the underlying standard is the real assets or the hard assets of the ultimate debtor. Uh-huh. Um, so credit money always has an issuer. There's always someone whose debt is being monetized. Which is the borrower? 
Um, yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. the borrower. Mm -hmm. So in the case of um, state-issued credit money, that ultimate debtor or ultimate borrower is the state. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, states tend to like credit monies, borrowers tend to like credit monies, uh -huh. because there's a certain amount of elasticity in the amount of trust that the users of that money have for you know just how many hard assets uh -huh. the borrower has to redeem that debt. So it's you know when when people are using credit money, they're they're not like verifying the collateral uh -huh. holdings right, right, of right, that right. ultimate debtor. They're well, just kind of trusting that like it's like a reputation credit rating thing, right? Yeah, like he's good for it, yeah. right? You know the the. It push comes to shove. <laughs> um, so there's there's latitude there, yeah. which allows them to print more money. Yes. Um, and the the users of that money in the short term can benefit because the, there's a lot more money in the market that they can transact with. So it increases the velocity of transacting. It can spur economic growth. Yeah. This is the whole Keynesian, yes. you know, right. uh, promise. Um, problem is, you know, that the ledger... Uh, of credit money is elastic, but it's not infinitely elastic. So there comes a point at which the users of credit money realize that the debtor isn't actually good for it, uh. and that's the moment the value collapses. Um, and so we can we can have a slow collapse, which is you know inflation, uh -huh. and then we can have rapid collapse, which is hyperinflation. Gotcha. Um, now, money, commodity money. Uh, has the commodity itself as the underlying standard. Uh -huh. So you can issue, you know, you can issue credit money and then you can issue IOUs on top of credit money and IOUs on top of those IOUs. So you can continue to monetize it in that way. You can do the same thing with commodity money. The question is just what is it that's at, at the end of that chain of IOUs? In the case of credit, we're coming for the debtor's hard assets. Uh -huh. um, in the case of nation states, that tends to be GDP. This is why debt to GDP ratio is so important. Um, in the case of commodity money, we're, we're coming for the commodity. We're right. coming for the gold, we're coming for the silver, we're coming for the Bitcoin, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, when you say GDP, that one strikes me as interesting because then we're saying the state and using credit money, the at the end of that chain of IOUs, as you described it, is the labor of the population. Exactly. And the state doesn't own that, no. I wouldn't say, but they're using it as collateral yes. effectively to engage in this system of credit money. Right. So there just seems like a moral hazard built into that almost. Absolutely. Um, and, and we can see this um, in the history of the United States in, in the 20th century. It used to be illegal for foreign governments and foreign entities to invest in um, U.S. companies, uh -huh. like to buy equities of U.S. companies. After we went off the gold standard in 1971, eh, that became legal. <laughs> and that percentage of foreign-owned equity in U.S. companies has just been skyrocketing. Uh -huh. Lynn Alden actually writes about this. She she like has the receipts. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's amazing. But the amount of of land, of real estate, of uh, commodities in the yeah. United States, and now equity in productive U.S. firms that is foreign owned is higher than ever, and continues to skyrocket because we're debtors. We're the world's biggest debtor. Right. So all these foreign governments, they're they're buying up the hard stuff. They're right. like, we don't know what's going to happen with the dollar. Right. We're going to hedge our bets. We're going to keep dollars, treasuries, whatever. Yeah. We're also going to buy some of your hard stuff just in case right. that doesn't work out. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. And that still gives the state a lot of power, though, because then they can nationalize those assets, right? Yep. They can risk, if you, well, the common example here is like uh, China buying a lot of land in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. So- if the U.S. were to default, not only could they default on those treasuries that China holds, we could also start to nationalize the assets. It's just, it, you get into a weird confidence game between right. individuals or states yeah. when you have these chains of IOUs circulating. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and this is this is one of the strategies that China's using as part of its um, Belt and Road Initiative. It's it's making loans 
to countries that it knows can't pay back uh-huh. these loans. Right. And it's saying, you know, for collateral, um, you're going to need to give us that port. You're going to need right. to give us that, you know, chemical plant. You're going to need to give us like this river valley or whatever. Uh-huh. And some of these countries um, have have in fact defaulted and it's become a political issue where they're saying, no, we're not going to pay up. Oh. We're not going to pay the collateral. Yeah. Well, you better have another lender because China was your lender of last resort. So now who are you going to go to? The IMF? Yeah. The World Bank? It's really bad. Yeah. This reminds me of Jeff Booth a long time ago on the show said that currency wars lead to trade wars lead to real wars. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of that sequence. Yeah. Um, okay. The next section you go to in the paper is titled Money, a Creature of the State. Yeah. I think we've established that it is not, um, <laughs> but this is probably a point of Graeber's argument, I guess, that money is a creature of the state. Yes. So there's there's this um, back and forth, you know, between state theorists of money and non-state theorists of money. Um, my theory of money that I'm proposing in this paper is that money can be a creature of the state. The state can issue money. It can issue money fully on credit. That's what fiat money is. Um, It can um, legally define uh, what constitutes legal tender within its jurisdiction. Absolutely can do all of that. But those are all social technologies uh, that have limits. uh, You know, technology can't do everything. It's built to solve a problem, but even its ability to solve that problem is limited. So the state's ability to force you and I to use its credit money um, comes up against a limit. Right. And this is, this is what uh, Weimar Germany, for example, illustrated so clearly. Um, Germany goes off the gold standard in 1914. Um, within a decade, it has the worst hyperinflation, you know, that's been recorded in human history. Um, why? Well, It goes off the gold standard to finance its participation in the First World War. It immediately depletes its gold reserves, banking on the fact that it's going to win the war Mm -hmm. and then convert the economic productivity, uh, the GDP of the countries it conquers back into gold. Uh They're like, we'll we'll get it back. Well, turns out they lose the war um, and they become in the position that they thought they were going to put other countries in. Mm. So the allied nations impose a debt burden on GD- on uh, Germany that so far outstrips its productive capacity, the GDP of the country, that its currency, um, which is not which is backed by that GDP, is seen as worthless. So Germany then starts just printing more and more and more of it to pay pay down its foreign debts. And also to pay its people, yeah, its workers, right. um, including its its agricultural workers, its farmers. Um, and there comes a point uh, at which farmers refuse to accept rice marks um, in exchange for their labor. And they stop working, which places the country on the brink of starvation. Um, and so very quickly, you know, within a, f- a few months, the central bank reinstitutes a gold standard you know uh a new reissues creates a new currency uh, backs it sort of kind of uh, with gold to the extent that it can um and you know that that is a touchy situation because everyone knows like the country doesn't really have any gold so right. like leads you know to the rise of the nazi party who then goes on an international rampage to get gold, get gold. yeah wow <laughs> um so it's 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 a very clear historical illustration of both what the state can do uh-huh. and what it can't do. Um, so there is state money. There is also non-state money. Yes. And just like Graeber says, in conditions of high trust, credit money is fine. Yeah. You know, if you if you have confidence in the state, high trust in the state, state issued money will work for many many different use cases. Yeah. But the moment you don't trust the state or the moment the rule of law collapses, people turn to other forms of money. Right. That, I think that's such an excellent illustration yeah. of the problem, right? Yeah. It's, 
not only do you have, well, you have the problem of gold's confiscatability to begin with, right? It's like, okay, we'll spend all our gold betting on the Nazi war machine that it will win World War I and then we'll get all of our gold back, right? Through seizure, basically conquering other countries. If that doesn't work out, you yeah. go into the horrors of hyperinflation, yeah. right? It, it literally rips society apart to the point where you've destroyed all of the trust fabric and you have to go back to a gold standard to get things to even operate. And then I think it also illustrates this deeper point, and it, it's a weird one, that the shape of gold flows internationally, like it corresponds closely to the shifting geopolitical order, right? Mm -hmm. It's like whoever has the gold right. kind of makes the rules. And so when the gold flows out of Germany, they go on a rampage to try to get it back. <laughs> um, there's also the the stories too of as the, the German Blitzkrieg was progressing across Europe, um, people in like Britain and France, they started shipping their gold to the US. Mm. So in case they got conquered, they didn't want to get plundered. Yeah, yeah. And so eventually the US has all the gold. Right, yeah. Once we have a, a lot of it, then we come into World War, this is later in World War II, obviously after the rise of Hitler, well, we've got the gold, we come in and win World War II, yeah. which is pretty much we just put an end to the war that had been raging in Europe, yeah. <laughs> declare ourselves victorious, then right. we hold the Bretton Woods Conference and say, the dollar's pegged to gold, all your right. currencies are pegged to us, Yeah, we'll ship you greenbacks, you ship us goods and services. Right, Like exactly. it's like gold is, it's driving the sovereignty of nations in a yep. way. Absolutely. No, uh, my, Michael uh, Hudson, a uh, historian, has uh, a really... Uh, really good account of this in his book super imperialism oh. um which tells the story of the united states becoming in effect europe's creditor um after the first world war because it wasn't just germany that depleted their gold reserves i mean all, france oh. the uk like they all went off the gold standard they all spent their treasure um and you know who was selling them arms uh -huh. the united states yeah um, and we demanded payment in gold. Uh -huh. um, we also demanded payment of war debts in gold. Uh -huh. So we basically sucked up three-fourths of the world's gold reserves in the first half of the 20th century because we were the creditors to all these countries. And that's and so, the story of the U.S. Yeah. rise to superpower, basically. Right, exactly. Yeah. So again, you follow the gold and right. you follow the <laughs> geopolitical power. Exactly. Very fascinating. <laughs> One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things, such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. 
With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Okay, you then go into payment versus settlement. Yes. And this is what I'm um, sort of drawing on um, the terminology used by my friend Nick Batia in his book, Layered Money. Yeah. He calls it deferred settlement versus final settlement. Right. So deferred settlement is the IOU, or mm -hmm. like I paid you mm -hmm. in an IOU, but it hasn't been settled and that you haven't taken possession yeah. of the commodity. Right. The under, you know, the asset at the end of the chain of IOUs, as mm -hmm. we've been saying, delivery of that asset or commodity at the end of that chain is the final settlement of the debt, right? The debt right. is extinguished. Right. So wh what do you go to, and you described it as two different social processes. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you tie payment versus settlement into this, the argument in the paper? Yeah. So um, sometimes in some uh, economic and anthropological literature, money is referred to as a means of payment. Um, now, payment is then usually taken to mean or defined as the process by which debts are settled. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting in, in this paper is that payment and settlement are two different social processes. So the process of payment involves me tendering payment. Um, I'm a debtor. I owe a debt. I tender payment to my creditor. Settlement is the process by which the creditor accepts that payment as a sufficient or satisfactory fulfillment uh -huh. of my obligation uh -huh. and erases the debt uh -huh. from the social ledger. Uh -huh. Now, um, usually, um, there are social conventions, norms, or laws around um, defining certain aspects of settlement. So, you know, in a legal tender type of situation, um, the law stipulates that only this type of money um, or, you know, these two types of money or whatever is legally defined can be used to settle debts within that jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, the Bank for International Settlements, for example, the uh -huh. Bank of Banks, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, they set banking policy for everyone within their network. They define final settlement as the irrevocable and unconditional tra transfer of an asset or financial instrument or the discharge of an obligation by the financial market infrastructure or its participants in accordance with the terms of the underlying contract. Final settlement is a legally defined moment. Uh. Um, what they're saying here is that um, the courts that enforce contracts need to have some standard legally to decide whether a debt has been paid. Uh -huh. And that's all well and good as long as you trust the law. Uh -huh. But if you're the creditor, um, you have the final determination. Like it's actually a psychological process. You decide whether that debt has been paid or not. Right. And so it's possible that a debt has been paid, uh -huh. but not settled uh. in the mind of the contractor. And this is a uh, contractor, a uh, creditor. And this is where you, where you can have situations like a uh, blood feud, for uh. example, where the, the debt that's in the ledger is a human life. Uh. You know, you killed my son. Uh -huh. um, legally, there, in our world today, there's a court process you go uh -huh. through. You might you might receive um, a financial settlement uh -huh. from uh, the murderer from their fam uh -huh. family. But you, as the creditor whose son was killed, may choose never to forgive this debt and to decide that is not 
even though it's legally defined, I do not accept that as settlement for this debt. And so you'll have situations where, you know, um, the the person, a family member of someone who's been murdered, will just walk into a courtroom wow. and shoot the killer, even though that's going to send them to prison because they had to settle that debt. Uh-huh. Um, and so when we talk about the rule of law, often what we're talking about is the community or some community bringing a greater violence to bear on the creditor, the creditors in that community to force them to accept final settlement when they otherwise would not be inclined to do that. Um, And so there's, there's a really interesting court case um, that uh, I'm, I'm writing about in the conclusion of this paper from 1605 called the case of mixed monies in which, um, and this is a paradigmatic court case because it set the precedent for um, the law of obligations within the United Kingdom uh, for hundreds of years. Mm. It, it was a situation in which um, a, a creditor um, had a contract, a merchant had a contract with, um, with someone to, um, for 100 pounds, worth of uh, commodities. Um, And if that 100 pounds was not paid by a certain date, then that that person, that debtor, would owe them 200 pounds. Uh. Um, Now, between the time that they concluded their contract and the debtor repaid that 100 pounds, the government of the United Kingdom had debased the currency. Uh, there was a rebellion in Ireland that they needed to put down, uh-huh. that they had to pay for, and they wanted to create less valuable money so that the rebels couldn't use that money to buy more weapons and supplies um, externally. Uh-huh. So literally the crown intervened and said, we're debasing the currency. And so the 100 pounds that the debtor paid back uh-huh. was worth a lot less than the 100 pounds the creditor had advanced him, and he took him to court. Um, The court ended up siding with the debtor because they said their reasoning was, in the eyes of the law, Uh the law can only say 100 pounds equals 100 pounds. The law can't make determinations about how much money is worth because inflation, deflation, these are not legal processes. They occur outside of the law. Yeah. Yeah, value is subjective. See value that. is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. So the legal process of final settlement is legal. Mm. It's a very narrow process. But the real and, process is psychological. Right. That's interesting. And so to the extent that we're in a relatively stable environment of value, a relatively fair rule of law where most people sort of accept the legitimacy of the courts and that, yeah, there's like unfair stuff that happens, but net net things are like generally fair yeah. and okay that's political legitimacy the moment people stop accepting that that's when legal settlement breaks down I am. that's so fascinating yeah it can, it's back to the whole high trust low trust environment thing right in, yeah. a, in a high trust environment maybe the credit money is enough right but if you know trust is collapsing society is collapsing the guy probably would have written that contract for, for gold, right? right. Instead right. of pounds or whatever it was written on. Right. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to think about. So especially it being psychological. Because yeah. like for me, I don't, if I'm going to take delivery of dollars, let's say in a contract, I probably wouldn't consider it finally settled until I turn those dollars into Bitcoin. Mm. So I know I'm not going to get debased. Right. Otherwise, I feel like I'm. the payment carries the liability of central bank counterfeiting in a way that you can't remove. So That's right. Very fascinating that there's a, a legal final settlement, a psychological final settlement. I never thought of that before. Yeah. Um, speaking of legal, you then later, and I, maybe this is in the conclusion that you're writing, you distinguish between legal money versus emergent money and how these, how credit and commodity money fit within this framework um, could you speak to that? What is legal money versus emergent money? Yeah. 
So this is this is kind of my summary of our entire conversation, you know, of the argument of the paper. There are really four kinds of money <laughs> um, in two broad categories. Really making this a lot more simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's legal money and emergent money. Yeah. Legal money is just top, it's top down money. Yeah. So whether it's decreed by a state or by the law in uh-huh. a stateless community, uh-huh. um, legal money is whatever the law defines as money. Uh-huh. Um, and that can be credit. So like fiat is an example of legal credit money. Uh-huh. Um, it can also be commodity. Yeah. Um, we've had state issued commodity monies. Uh-huh. Um, so that's one category of money. Um, second category is emergent money. That's the bottom up stuff. So, you know, things like uh, shell beads, uh-huh. you know, um, Sabo writes a lot about, you know, the evolution of collectibles uh-huh. um, that becomes like the earliest form of commodity money. There is no state right. um, decreeing this, um, you know, they're, they're, wasn't even necessarily a normal uh, a formal system of laws there were norms around what was valuable and how that value was measured denominated in these you know more or less fungible tokens uh-huh. um, but, but these, these were all emerging bottom up uh-huh. um, you can also have bottom up credit money um, you know you and I if we want to transact and we trust each other we don't need to be exchanging commodities Um, we can just, we can create our own ledger. We don't even have to write it down. Um, And this, I think, is actually Graeber's point, is that the most ancient form of money is credit in this sense, in that I do you a favor, you do me a favor. People do it all the time, right? Right. Let me borrow 50 bucks, whatever. Right, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll get you next time, you know? And like, for the most part, like if we trust each other, we're not like, nickeling and diming each other, literally, yeah. measuring it down to that little level of specificity. There's a general sense of reciprocity. Uh, um, and and so this is what Graeber is really getting at, I think, when he's, he's saying, you know, um, money is credit. Um, but there are, in fact, times when we need to measure value uh-huh. very precisely. Uh-huh. And that's where commodity money comes in even emergent commodity money. Yeah. And so we, we were talking earlier about um, how this just happens, like in the video game Diablo 2. Uh-huh. Lynn Alden talks about this in her book, Broken Money. This is a great example. There was a legally defined money in that game. The game creators said, gold, no. that's your money. But the users of the game were like, well, this, this isn't actually a very useful medium of exchange. It didn't hold enough value. Right. It was actually like to trade for the really expensive items. Right. It wasn't useful enough. So you needed something more valuable. Right. I, I say this as a guy that played the game. As well. No, so, no. Yeah. This, it's awesome. <laughs> I, I love this. Yeah. And this is exactly Sabo's point that emergent commodity monies start out as stores of value. Yeah. So we had a collectible in the game, the Stone of Jordan, that because it was valuable... Um, and standardized, a unit of measure, it could be collected and then used as a medium of exchange. Yes. And that became the money yes. in the game. And there were, there were in the trade window, there were 40 little square slots, <laughs> and the Son of Jordan Ring only took up one slot. So it was divisible in that way, that you could price things, you know, this is 14, yeah. this is 35. Yeah. It was useful in that way, whereas other larger items took up too many, you know, they take up eight right. blocks at a time, so they're not as divisible as money. Yeah, yeah. So all these things, it was just weird. It was all pre-Bitcoin, but I was like seeing this happen. I'm like, I don't know. It Almost in the back of my mind, like how did, I'm noticing this thing become money, but I'm like, yeah. how did this become money? Right. And then it got even weirder later when eBay came about and people started selling, like a Son of Jordan Ring would sell on eBay for, I don't know, 80 bucks or something. Like they had real economic value, real economic value. Right. And that was, yeah, this kind of laid the groundwork in my mind for something big is coming from this digital internet thing to money. I didn't yeah. know it was going to be Bitcoin, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's exactly right. That's a, a classic example of emergent commodity money. It's just happening digitally. Yeah. 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 There's the, you always hear the stereotypical case of prisoners of war. And the camps, they start trading cigarettes as yeah, money, you know, things exactly. like this. So, 
it makes sense. You know, it's back to that most saleable good thing. It's like whatever's most widely accepted, most widely demanded just sort of functions as a, a medium of exchange for everything else, almost by definition, right? Right. I think it was like if if you have a, a hierarchy of liquidity, of, you know, different things that are being traded in this network, whatever is at the top of that stack, it just is money. Yeah. It's like because it's most widely accepted, you can it trades against almost everything else. It's the shortest path to get from the thing you have to the thing you want. Right. So exactly. it's just it's and so there's not there's no state or uh, there's no state element to that right it's just a naturally emergent phenomenon. Yep, exactly. Interesting. Okay, so you end up then with legal money and emergent money. So top down money, bottom up money. Mm-hmm. Either one can be credit or commodity based, um, just based on kind of the the level of trust and the technological development in the society. Yep. And you end up, I guess you just make a quadrant of this, right? And you end up somewhere in that quadrant. Yep. Does emergent money tend toward commodity money? Is that what we saw with gold becoming kind of like the universal standard of money in the 20th century? Um, it's, It's two different use cases. So emergent money can be credit or commodity. Um, emergent credit monies, uh, are used in situations of high trust. Uh-huh. So, you know, to use, to use your prison example, right? Um, like uh, prisoners could monetize a favor. Right. Like, hey, um, you know, Bill has 15 minutes of extra phone time. Yeah. And like that then becomes an IOU yeah, that yeah, gets yeah. passed around, circulated among uh, prisoners. Right. That, that would be an example of commodity or, or uh, credit money. Um, whereas the cigarette, you know, that's a commodity money, right? So let me reframe the question then. At a global scale, because almost by definition, a global geopolitical order is a low trust environment, yeah. right? Countries don't trust one another. Right. They're inherently antagonistic. Does money at that scale tend towards commodity money because it's low trust? That's why we get gold right. as a standard versus one world government currency, which I hope is not coming. <laughs> yes, ex- exactly. So even George Friedrich Knapp in his state theory of money, even though he says like all, all money is a creature of law, he nevertheless recognizes, you know, commodity money is actually very useful for international trade. Uh-huh. Um and hmm, why could that be? Well, maybe because these countries don't share the same law. Uh-huh. So what I decree as law is not what you decree as law. Uh-huh. And so how can money be a creature of law if there is no international law that we're both subordinated to? Right. And if there's no super state, yes. you know, in, a, in effect. Yes. Um, so you need a low trust medium of exchange. And that's what commodity is. And this takes us back to, you know, the story of barter. Uh-huh. Um, it's not... It, like there was never a historical stage where like you know neighbors were all bartering with each other or like people who trusted each other were bartering with each other no that was a credit situation for the most part but where barter did tend to occur and still does occur is between groups of strangers so countries barter with each other um tribes barter with each other families barter with each other um and commodity money is an extraordinarily useful solution to the problem of double coincidence of wants between strangers, strange groups. Um, so it's, you know, we're full circle now back <laughs> to the problem that money solves. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Full circle. We have come and speaking of super state, yeah. I've actually used that term in talking yeah, about the significance of Bitcoin. Um, what is the utility of Bitcoin and the scope of all of this monetary anthropological theorizing? What is the utility of Bitcoin? Is it is it money? Is it could it be money? Is it useful? Is it not useful? How do you view Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I see Bitcoin as digital commodity money. And so it has all the advantages of a digital technology, meaning that it's, you know, hyper portable, uh, hyper fungible, 
hyper uh, divisible. And it is a commodity because it does have inherent value. Its inherent value is in the fact that it's self-verifying. Um, so if something's transacted on the Bitcoin network, you know it's really Bitcoin. Uh -huh. It's not fake. Like that is that is on the chain. Um, it's self-verifying and self-settling. So in a Bitcoin transaction, you have automated final settlement, meaning you don't have to go get your cousins, like you know, with their weapons to <laughs> <laughs> to get your money back. Yeah, because that shit is settled on chains. Yes. Um, there is extraordinary value in that. Um, these are functions that until Bitcoin um, were the nation state was trying to capture, you know, to define legally final settlement, to define what gold is, you know, what yeah. purity, how, how you verify whether it's really gold, right. really silver, whatever. No, that is all now digitally automated. Yeah, so it's like putting, like if I put the gold coin across the table, that's sort of a self-verifying, self-settling transaction, right? Like you've taken possession of the gold. It's it may be self settling, um, oh, but it's not to, self verifying. You would have to still verify. You still it. have to verify that's, right. that that's really gold. You'd have to <laughs> say the gold and test it and whatnot. Right? Yeah. Bitcoin is like putting the self a self assaying gold coin yes. through an electric wire. Exactly. Right? Like it just arrives. You know it's Bitcoin. It's yep. You can audit the transaction history. You verify with your node. So it it if we needed deferred settlement money to make gold more portable. Mm -hmm. But gold was, here's a way, I, here's a way I've put it before. Mm -hmm. So gold's really good at holding value across time, right? Yeah. That's the store value property. Not so good at moving value across space because it's heavy. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We introduce banknotes, right? right. So, or, or um, credit right. money, basically, right. right? Credit money's really good at moving across space, but gets monopolized, you get this counterparty risk, and it tends to depreciate over time, tends mm -hmm. to become fiat, basically. Mm -hmm. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin's like money optimized for moving value across time and space. Because right. it's dematerialized gold. Right. So seems pretty important in the anthropological history of money, perhaps. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a revolution. Um, and like we were talking about, you know, with social institutions and social technologies, Bitcoin is a new kind of social institution that calls into question, like you were saying, whether we still need central banks um, and to what extent do we need the state to enforce final settlement. Um, these older technologies are becoming obsolete. I'm thinking those central bankers are going to be about as mad as those pissed off patriarchs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely are. They are they are rallying and they're um, mm. they're insisting on the kind of priestly um, their their work in in this almost like religious church like structure uh -huh. of mediating value to the masses. Uh -huh. Like, but you know, what do you mean the people can read? Uh -huh. Like. Uh -huh. You know, it's it's like the Gutenberg revolution. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah very much. I, I think um, you mentioned the BIS earlier. Yeah. Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks. The head of the BIS is Augustin Cartus, maybe is his name. Carstens, I Carstens. think, yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. He had some quote where, I'm paraphrasing, trust, the soul of money is trust, I think. But as you've gone into here, it's like, well, not necessarily. Right. There's high trust right. environments and low trust environments, and there's different monies appropriate to each. Right. But to your point, like this saintly, priestly, like what is this? The soul of money is trust. Like, right. Who I don't know who are these people. Like they, they, exactly. You, whose right is it to monopolize any good and say, you know, this is the car you have to drive, or this right. is the table you have to use? Or the, yeah. It's just silly, and yeah. I think. I can't imagine a future that people don't wake up from this. Right. Because it's just that it's so ridiculous. Yeah. No, I think the people of the future are going to be like, you just you just trusted these guys? <laughs> like, there's like 12 guys in um, in the United States that like get together and 
Did they have a good track record? Well, no, no. They hyperinflated <laughs> no, every really, currency since the beginning of time. It was really bad, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah. Um, where, Natalie, can people find you on the internet? Yes. So I'm on Twitter at nsmolensky. Um, you can also find me at, um, you can just Google Texas Bitcoin Foundation. Um, we're a nonprofit. Again, 501c3. Donations are tax deductible. So if you want to send us some sats, please, please. We, you know, this is a fully volunteer effort on my part. I work a nine to five software job. So um, any any little bit of help is is more than welcome. And we look forward to uh, returning that value. Um, with the publication of the Satoshi Papers next year. Beautiful. That's uh, wonderful stuff. When will this be published? This is going to be in the Satoshi Papers. Oh, this will be in the Satoshi yep. Papers. Okay. Yep. All right. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Natalie, thank you so much for doing this. My great pleasure.